Hey, welcome to this episode of How in the Health. We are lucky to have Dr. Mark Mariani, who is an orthopedic surgeon, and he has been practicing for 40 years. So this is a super awesome episode. He's going to take us through how things have changed over the time that he's been practicing, and I hope you enjoy. All right, Dr. Mark Mariani, thank you for joining the How in the Health podcast. Thanks for being here. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. This is super exciting. So we've talked a little bit about, I I had a buddy who's uh, an orthopedic surgeon. He's finishing up residency in your same specialty. So he's just getting started out. And then we have you who's been doing it for 40 years now. So Uh it'll be interesting to hear these perspectives. So I want to hear a little bit about your story. How would you describe what you do to somebody who's not in healthcare? Well, basically, I'm uh, in orthopedics. If you're an orthopedic surgeon, you're dealing with bones and joints. Mm -hmm. And subsequently, as you know, with your with your friend, uh, the field is so large that most orthopedic surgeons subspecialize into one particular area within uh, the musculoskeletal system. So my area of expertise, where I did my fellowship and my training, is uh, in uh, adult reconstruction, which is hip and knee, basically hip and knee replacements. Okay. And, and have those specialties always been around? I mean, as you were going through med school residency, those were the specialties have more come about over time? More have come about, yeah. and more and more people now do an extra year of fellowship, and I think you said your friend is doing a fellowship in uh, adult reconstruction. So that's just become more and more of the norm uh, where you do five years of a residency and then another year in a subspecialty um, in the what other, other area, into another area that you would uh, then specialize in. Uh, but even when you come out of uh, uh, school and even when you come out of uh, re- uh, your fellowship, um, you still do a lot of general stuff. So you're still taking an emergency room call and doing a lot of trauma and fractures and all those things. Those are things that, you, that orthopedic surgeons do, even as they're developing their uh, clientele in their subspecialty. So you end up doing a lot of the general stuff initially, and then you just kind of focus as you go along and as you get uh, your patient uh, um, base build up, if you will. Yeah, yeah, super interesting. And <coughs> how did you choose to become a doctor? What was that yeah. story like? You know, an interesting, I just always wanted to do it. I was always interested in uh, uh, the sciences. I was always interested in anatomy as a kid growing up. My dad was in business. I worked uh, I worked uh, driving a truck when I was in high school uh, for his, in his warehouse. And that was fun, but I just knew I didn't want to go into that business uh, uh, type of scenario. I just always enjoyed dealing with people, and I enjoyed, uh, I just always wanted to do medicine. It was it's something that, uh, in fact, my dad gave me a book on my 12th birthday called the human body and um he signed it and dated it and he signed it and he said uh, uh to mark happy birthday your first medical book and it's 1969 i believe is uh the date on it wow yeah crazy huh that's super cool and did you always know you wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon or did no. that come about later yeah that came about uh, as i was going through med school yeah. uh, i thought i wanted to be a pediatrician for a while and then i did uh, some surgical um rotations in, in um, med school and really liked the surgical side of it and then did an orthopedic uh, um, rotation with Sherm Coleman who was a huge name in orthopedic surgery he was the head of the department at the University of Utah where I was going to med school and he had a huge influence on my decision and yeah. so I decided to go into orthopedics. Wow that, and well that's a pretty competitive specialty mm-hmm. so I'm, I'm assuming that added a lot of stress to your life as you're going through medical school and then yeah getting yeah. matched well you know it's interesting because i think uh you know when you're young and dumb you don't realize uh i didn't realize how competitive it was and sherm coleman who was just a great mentor you know he sat me down and said you know where do you think you want to go he wanted me to go out of state because i was born and raised here went to the university of utah he thought it'd be a good idea and it was to go away to do residency and so he had me go to some various places to see what i liked and i, and I came back and i said well i like Mayo clinic and that was really cool And, uh, you know, not knowing. Um, And so he said, okay, and the next thing I know, I'm going to Mayo Clinic. But I know in retrospect that the reason I got in there, you know, that was back in the day when where department heads would call each other. And I'm sure Sherm called uh, the department head. Well, I know he did at Mayo and said, hey, I've got a kid that I think would be a good fit. And the next thing I know, I'm going to Mayo. Now, on that flip end of it, when I went to Mayo and then I stayed on staff and I was on the selection committee subsequently, I realized just how... uh, crazy competitive it is Mm. and i would oftentimes think back to sherm coleman and think man and i told him um i said i owe my residency to you because i know that's how i got into mayo clinic and he would always say no 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 you 
you had all the credentials you did it on your own, but I know that that made a huge difference. But yeah, to answer your question, it's very competitive. Yeah, I, I seem to hear that frequently of as you're going through not, I mean, your undergrad medical school yeah. and then getting into residency, the people that you associate with and the people that are your mentors or influencers, they're, they're a huge deal in huge. getting where you need to go and huge. becoming who you want to become. So. Yeah, they're huge. So you Absolutely. went to med school at, at the University of Utah and then the Mayo Clinic is where? Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Oh, all right. Yeah, everybody thinks it's Rochester, New York, but it's Rochester, Minnesota in the Midwest. Beautiful facility, and I stayed there. I was a resident for five years, and then fortunately they asked me to stay on in the adult reconstruction uh, department. So I did my fellowship and then stayed on staff there for another five years. Wow. And then then decided I wanted to come back to the West. Yeah. It's yeah. hard to beat the West. <laughs> <laughs> I agree there. I'm, yeah. I'm biased. Uh, so... As you have interacted with with medical school students and those in residency now, how has that changed over your career? As you as you recall and look back on your time in medical school and residency versus what it looks like now, what changes have you seen over the years? I think it's uh, I think it's similar, although my impression now they have rules about how hard they can work the residents, how mm -hmm. how many hours the residents can work in a given week. I think that's a big change from what it used to be. Um, it used to be you were just you just planned on being there. I mean, and, you know, if you got an evening off or if you got to go home, you got to. But you know, there were days you'd stay two, three days in the hospital and never leave. That's changed a lot. Yeah. It's more civil than it used to be. Mm -hmm. um, although I don't want to give you the wrong impression, they treated us really, really well at Mayo. I was never mistreated at all. But that's changed, and I think some of the options that um, residents have coming out now are different. Private practice versus being employed, uh, there's a big shift now towards being employed um, for a lot of reasons we can get into. I mean, insurance and, and those kind of things. It's just a, I think it's a better option now for the, uh, the people that are finishing. Plus, I think it gives them a better lifestyle mm -hmm. and it gives them more time with their family than what we used to have, um, both as residents and then when we came out, if we went into private practice. So, different ball game. so you're saying back when you were coming out of residency, it was more normal to just go to a hospital and be, be an employee of a hospital system? No, I think back when I came out, th that was a certainly an option. That's what I did at Mayo. I was, yeah. you know, when I joined Mayo Clinic uh, on staff, I was employed and it was great. I mean, they took care of everything and, all, and what I got to do is focus on patient care. And then, then I decided I want to be more entrepreneurial. And I wanted my own thing. And so when I came back to Salt Lake um, with Mike Bourne, who was there with me, he's also a Salt Lake native, we wanted to have our own thing. So we were in private practice and fiercely independent. Mm. And now 30 years down the line, you know, I've come full circle where I don't think, particularly in Utah, I don't think that's a really great option anymore for uh, people. I think the better option for people is employment now. Why is that? Why do you think that the... Well, for a lot of reasons. First is dealing with insurance companies is really frustrating. It takes a lot of time and effort and manpower that you're paying for mm -hmm. uh, to get pre-authorization. And then what you see when you're doing services, you see that you, through the years we've seen the unilateral devaluation of what we do. I mean, we just get paid progressively less. So in real dollars, we're paid less now than we were 10 years ago. And if you uh, adjust that to inflated dollars, it's even worse so it's really hard to make an office go, pay the overhead, pay your malpractice, and, and receive the benefit that you think you should be receiving now as opposed to what it was you know, 30 years ago. And so especially if you're dealing with uh, joint reconstruction and you have at one point I was 63% Medicare, where on Medicare you're getting less than 25 cents on the dollar. So it's hard to make all those expenses and still receive a uh, salary that that is commensurate with what you're what you're doing. So by in fact we just let's see 3 years ago we sold to HCA and now I'm employed again so I've come full circle. Yeah. It's a much better thing now than it, than it was before and I think and my partners are much happier especially the young ones are much happier with the employment uh, scenario cuz they're not so worried about about um, collecting and the office overhead expenses and seeing what what their you know they they bill x and the insurance company knocks it down to x minus y mm -hmm. and and they get frustrated with that now they can just um practice be paid on a certain rate per rvu <coughs> and uh and go about their business and uh 
and then the hospital and their administration takes care of the you know the employees and the office overhead and all that and they don't have to worry about that that used to be a fun thing to do but it's not anymore it's just gotten so cumbersome well it seems like you need almost an advanced business degree to be you able do. to handle all of that right so on top of your medical training now That's you right. need to understand the business and you know when i came my undergraduate degree was in business finance so i like to say i, I knew just enough to be dangerous yeah and uh and it was fun i mean mike Bourne and i had a lot of fun putting together the group and growing it and and back then when it was reasonable to do, but uh, the forces the forces of the medical um, situation now are such that uh, if, a, if a young guy, your friend, for instance, mm-hmm. um, coming out, I, I think they're better off in an employed situation now because of the because of the things that are out of their control, specifically the the uh, insurance scenario. Yeah, that's interesting because I, as I was shadowing going through undergrad, some other doctors, one had been in practice for five to seven years. And so I was asking him about this, like how right. has insurance changed your right. life versus the others that I'd shadowed who'd been in it a while. And he said, you know, I can't, I, I came up with this. This is what I know. Right. And then the ones who had been in practice a long time, they were saying, this has changed my life. And right. it's made me reconsider certain things kind of to your right. point. And right. it's interesting how that landscape has shifted over the past few years and now the buddies of mine like they won't know what it was like no they don't to do the private practice stuff because it just that isn't feasible no it's not and especially in utah where you have the domination by two big entities hca and ihc they control it and in in some states uh, minnesota for example uh, physicians are able to like own outpatient facilities or own um outpatient facilities for total joints, for instance, which is, is another topic of how the um, hospital stay has decreased so much uh, uh, postoperatively. Uh, but in Utah, you don't have those options. I mean, it's almost, it'd be impossible to have your own surgical center, for example, um, uh, without having HCA or IHC involved in that. Uh, and we, we tried. So I know the headaches and all the hoops that we tried to jump through to try to get those things done and never were able to do so. Mm. And my young partners, you know, just became progressively more frustrated with the scenario. And they're much happier now uh, having an employment situation, which remunerates them very, very well. Mm-hmm. And they don't have to worry about all that stuff anymore. And they don't have to worry about what they're getting paid because they get paid the same, regardless of if it's a Medicare patient or a private uh, pay patient or a uh, private insurance patient. And if they're up in the middle of the night with a with a uh, traumatized patient that has no insurance. I mean, back in the day, we would just realize we're not getting paid for this. We're just, this is just our debt to society. But now when they're up in the middle of the night, they still get paid for that. Mm -hmm. They're not the ones taking the hit for that. So it's a better scenario now, I think, for a younger um, physician. So if somebody was coming out and talking to me and I do tell them, what do you think? Should I go into private practice or should I join forces like become employed with IHC or with HCA or one of the other entities out there. Steward is another one now. I tell them I'd really seriously consider being employed. I think it's better for them. It's better for their lifestyle too that they want. That's so interesting to me because as I think through just the natural human inclination to make decisions based off of certain consequences, right? So how much of the decision as you're going in to treat a patient is dependent on if they have insurance or not, or what that situation looks like for your practice or right, right. the possibility for lawsuits or anything like that. Does that come into play as you're interacting with people? Is like, are you taking all of the potential consequences that could come up or is it just kind of, there's a problem and let's fix it. Yeah. You have to approach it. There's a problem. Let's fix it. And all yeah. the other stuff you got to let go. Um, and back when we were in private practice, um, I used to oftentimes, um, most of the time I never knew if they had insurance or what their insurance was. I didn't want to know. Yeah. Um, because you can't, you can't let that influence what you do. You just have to treat everybody um, based on their problem and treat them all the same and treat it appropriately. Do the right thing, is yeah. what we always yeah. say. If you do the right thing, everything else follows. Um, back when I was in private practice, there was enough, there was enough, um, of, of a, uh, enough extra, let's say, that you could, you could consume the no payers mm-hmm. and still do okay. Um, you could tolerate that, but now, now you can't. So yeah. um, it's better for the hospital or for those insurance entities to absorb that and then pay you an appropriate rate and uh, be paid that way and not worry about it and go home and enjoy your family. The, the, yeah. the newer breed too, the, 
the uh, I call them kids. I mean, the ones that are 30 years younger than me. Yeah. They have a different perspective, and it's probably a better perspective than what I had and what Mike Bourne had when we came out. I mean, we just came out, and it was all about work. Mm. And fortunately, we both have wives that are fabulous, and they were home um, taking care of all those issues, you know, at home. And uh, we were free to... Uh, to be there all the time. I mean, we were working 70, 80 hour weeks. The new generation, they don't want that. And I understand that they want to be, they want to be able to go to their kid's soccer game or they want to be able to see their son's baseball game. And they want to be able to be home before their kids are in bed. And the way to do that is through an employment situation. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. so interesting. As I started this podcast, I, I looked at how siloed all of the systems were in healthcare. Yeah. And in my mind, it was initially, well, this is a bad thing because they're not communicating. And there's a lot of waste in right. here. But the way that you had mentioned, I didn't want to know if they had insurance or not. I think in that aspect, it's good to keep it siloed because it doesn't right. you're making the right decision based off of the information you have and not this external information that could kind of persuade that's you that's to go exactly somewhere right. else. Right. So that way you're not you're not advising a surgical procedure or not right. based on whether or not the patient is able to pay for that surgical yeah. Uh, procedure or not you just have to treat it you have to treat the entity and forget about all that other stuff wow that's that's super interesting so you you had brought up rvu what what is yeah, an yeah. rvu relative value unit and so every procedure that we do has an attached through medicare and then subsequently all the insurance companies has an attached uh relative value unit it gives you so many so a total hip has it generates so many units for me. Okay. And then based on what my contract is with HCA, they pay me X number of dollars per RVU. So gotcha. when I do a total hip on somebody, whether it's because of a fracture through the emergency room, whether it's um, a Medicare patient, whether it's a younger patient with developmental uh, dysplasia issues and secondary degenerative arthritis, I get paid the same because the RVU is the same. Gotcha. And so I get paid the same rate per RVU. And again... So I'm not dealing with insurance companies anymore. That's up to HCA to do that. And then they pay me um, what my contract states. So it's, it just gets rid of all that extra yeah. stuff. Yeah. No, that's interesting. You know? as, as we go back to the workload that has kind of shifted both through medical school residency and now in the practice, mm-hmm. right, and the newer, the, the kids that are coming up with the work-life yeah. balance, my mind has always gone like, man, if somebody is working – three days in a row at a hospital, like mentally, how does that impact how you're able to cognitively deal with stress? Is that something that you just adapt to? How does the body and the mind deal with lack of sleep? Well, it's, uh, I like to think that uh, we just adapted to it, Mm -hmm. you know, in retrospect, uh, um, I was having this discussion with somebody the other night, and they said, how could you be operating on people if you've been up for 48 hours? And Back when I was doing that at Mayo as an intern and a resident, um, specific, especially as an intern, if I'd been up for 48 hours, the good part was I was there seeing a ton of stuff. Mm-hmm. And the good part for the patient was I wasn't the one making the decisions. Yeah. You know, I was kind of the one that was needing to be there to see. But the senior person, okay, so the staff person or the fifth-year resident, those, those people were not doing the all-night in the hospital deal. Gotcha. They were the ones making the decision. So, and then I'd be there, you know, I'd be there if we were in in there in the middle of the night doing something, I'd be there in there um, just learning. So how do you handle it? You just do. It's just kind of a, I used to refer to it as a five-year goat week. I mean, (laughs) you just do it and you're supervised enough that, that, uh, you know, bad things usually don't happen. But I think that they happened enough that the... uh, universally, I mean, those decisions were made to say, hey, you can't work a resident, you know, over, I don't know what the hours are anymore, um, but I think it's so many, so many hours a week they can't go over, and if they're yeah. over, they have to go home, and that's yeah. probably a good thing. Yeah. I like to give them grief and say, you, you don't have it as tough as we have. <laughs> <laughs> they well, would disagree. It's funny because I was talking to that buddy who's now in his second year of residency, and I was like, man, do you look back at first-year medical students and go, man, they're so naive? And then and then when you became a third-year medical student, looking back at the second yeah. years, and now you're second year in residency and looking back at the first, he's like, oh, yeah, like I, I look back, and at the time I thought I was so smart and I knew everything, and then now I look back and I was like, oh, I didn't know anything. Yeah, you quickly find that out. Yeah, it's a similar yeah. thing I would think after the 40 years you've been doing this, looking back at your just out of residency self. Oh, yeah. Thought you owned the world and you knew it all and you were ready to go. Right. But there's a lot that has 
has changed. Oh, yeah, you quickly learn you don't know, especially when you come out of med school and you're an intern. Yeah. You quickly know you don't know anything. Yeah. And that's why you need to be supervised. So, And that's why the residency is five years. I mean, there's a lot to learn. Um, and then once you finish, you're not done because if I practice the same way I did when I was – first board certified, which was 30 years ago, it'd be malpractice. I mean, the way we do total joints now and the way and the hospital stays are so much different than it was back then that you just have to continue to keep up. And that's where CMEs come in and the board uh, mm -hmm. being board certified and going through all of that process that they force you to go through to stay certified is so valuable and so effective yeah. for people. Well, let's dive into that a little bit over the course of your career, how things have changed. So what has made you more effective in your role based on just diagnosis diagnosis and treatment changes over the last? Yeah, so year? the imaging, imaging is better uh, all the way from x-rays through CT scans, through MRI scans. All that is better. Um, probably the biggest thing for us in uh, adult reconstruction is the prostheses are better, the components are better. They used to be stainless steel, now they're titanium and cobalt chrome. And that just means it's more durable? Stronger, it's more durable, more. yeah. The, the bearing surfaces used to be polyethylene mm -hmm. on a steel head, um, a stainless steel head. Now it's uh, enhanced polyethylene, which is what we call cross-linked and has extra stuff in it. The bioengineers you know, have come up with all of that. And the, the heads are now ceramic. Mm -hmm. So the friction, what we call the coefficient of friction, is markedly less. So the, the wear, the polyethylene wear, which would cause subsequent inflammation and, and uh, delamination of the polyethylene, that is so much less now. So they last longer. And then the surgical techniques are just so much better. I mean, the way we get in there and get out, it's, it's soft tissue maintenance. It's, it's uh, minimizing the trauma to the soft tissues. Uh, the perioperative pain control is better. And patients are in the hospital now 24 hours or less, where when I was an intern, a patient would be admitted to Mayo the night before surgery, and they would have, have their surgery, and they would stay for two weeks. Wow. And on the last day they'd stay, my job was to go around and take everybody's stitches out. Mm. <laughs> and that's just gradually gone from uh, uh, two weeks to 10 days, seven days, three days, and now... 99%, 98% of the total joints we do stay less than 24 hours. Wow. Yeah, it's amazing. We have someone in our office who was a teenager, had some sort of a knee surgery, and same thing. He said he was in the hospital for like two weeks, and then oh, it yeah. took him like six months to get back to where he could right. run and play again. Right. And right. and now that seems like it's been reduced. Oh, totally reduced. When, right. when we would do a, a knee replacement, and so this is back in the early 80s, uh, hospital for two weeks, and initially we'd have him in this big, bulky dressing in full extension for the knees out fully straight for uh, the first two weeks. Well, when you take that dressing off and somebody's post-op bent it with their knees straight out for two weeks, it's just, it's turned to stone. And mm -hmm. for those people to start moving it um, was just incredibly difficult for them. Now they wake up and they have a machine on their knee that's moving it wow. right, out of the, right out of the gate. Um, and so... It, just the techniques and the post-op care is so much different now than it used to be. Was that just because back in the 80s, I mean, are you open cutting, like making a huge incision and uh -huh. opening opening up the knee, whereas now you can kind of go more focused and targeted? Well, we or, still have to make an hip. incision, yeah. yeah. In adult reconstruction, I like to bug the uh, sports guys and tell them that we still make an incision. Those guys are dealing through little portals all yeah. the time. But we make an incision. But the incisions are smaller, mm -hmm. and there's much more attention to soft tissue preservation. We used to just fillet things open. You know, particularly in the hip joint, we would open them up and take down muscles and tendons and, that we'd have to repair. Now we drop in through the front through a natural interval, and we drop right down onto the capsule, open up the capsule, do the work, close the capsule, and that's it. Wow. We don't take down muscles and tendons anymore like we used to. And way back when, even preceding me with a hip replacement, they used to take off the top of the femur, what's called the greater trochanter. They would take that off to expose it, do the surgery, and then wire that back down. Wow. Now, you can imagine how good that felt oh, postoperatively to the patient. So, uh, and then the big move uh, after that was to not have to take off the trochanter, and now we don't take down muscles or tendons anymore. So, and even with the with the with um, my colleagues who go posteriorly, and they, that can be a beautiful, uh, that can be done really, really well also, their, their amount of soft tissue dissection is greatly decreased and the amount of tendons that they have to take down is greatly decreased as well. So it's all about, um, it's all about um, uh, 
people call it minimally invasive surgery, MIS. Um, I don't think that's the greatest term in the world. I mean, you got to see what you're doing. But everybody is much more cognizant of being soft tissue preservation minded. Yeah. Yeah. The, the trauma to the body, it sounds like, has been minimalized. Minimalized. Dramatically. Yeah, it's, it's amazing the difference. I mean, I watch people come in at two weeks post-op now into my office, and I think back to 25 years ago of when they'd walk in at two weeks. Well, 25 years ago, they'd be on a walker in sweatpants and just looking at me like, oh, man, what did you do to me? Am I ever going to feel better? And now at two weeks, they just come walking in, and most of them aren't even on any uh, supports at two weeks now. Mm -hmm. It's just a different ball game. It's a different animal which makes it really fun. Yeah, take me through how you learned that, right? Because 25 years ago, you weren't performing no. surgery how you are now, and that mm -hmm. seems like it's a pretty dramatic change in Huge. how you used to do it to now. So how Huge. does a doctor go through and learn the new techniques yeah. in the middle of your regular practice and everything yeah, else going a great, on? It's a great question. It gets back to uh, the uh, uh, being board certified and through the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons requiring continuing medical education, CME, so you're going to meetings every year. You're having to do um, updated quizzes every year, uh, read about things. Uh, and through those mechanisms, you start seeing what's out there. You know, hey, we're trying this now. We're trying that now. Whether it's how do we deal with pulmonary, how do we deal with blood clots after surgery? How do we do, deal with postoperative pain? What can we do preoperatively to help with postoperative pain? Those kind of things. You're seeing those things at the meetings that you're going to. And then in addition you've got partners that are pushing you along and the young guys come in and they think they know everything. They quickly learn they don't, but they, they come in, they think they know everything. And they say, Hey, you know, in my fellowship uh, just last year, we were trying this, which is really thought provoking and that gets you going. And then, then in reading and whatnot, you, you read things that might, um, for instance, on the direct anterior approach, um, the two previous approaches that we were doing, which was like straight lateral and, and a posterior approach, bothered me always for for different reasons but i always thought that there was a problem with both of those approaches i don't need to get into the specifics of that but so i was reading an article written by a guy by the name of joel matta uh, out of california uh, this was now f 14 15 years ago who was doing this thing called a direct anterior approach which back then there wasn't much traction to it, and everybody was kind of poo-pooing it and whatnot. But as I was reading it, I thought, wow, you know, if this thing is the real deal, it's the best of both worlds because you get intraoperative imaging so you can see exactly where you are and what you're doing as you're building the joint, and you're not violating any of the abductor muscles or the posterior structures. So Mike Bourne and I got on a plane and flew down and spent a day with Joel uh, in surgery. And then the biggest thing that uh, we got out of, we, we went up on the floor and started talking to the nurses about what do these patients feel like postoperatively? And they were like, oh, wow, they, it's a different ballgame. These people just don't hurt as bad, and they get up and going as fast. And the, and the, protoc the postoperative protocols are different. They don't have all the precautions that the other approaches had. So anyway, one thing leads to another, and we started doing that and doing uh, cadaver dissections to figure out how to do it and to do it right and go into sessions and whatnot. And that's just build up. That's probably the biggest thing that uh, uh, has happened in the last 15 years. But it's those kind of things that, yeah. that influence you. Have, has the equipment that you used or that you use changed over that yeah. time too, or is it the same? Because so, no. that's the other thing too, is how do you get training on new equipment that's yeah. coming out? Well, there's a lot of sessions, and quite honestly, uh, industry has been really helpful with that. So various uh, um, companies who, who make these devices will also hold seminars uh, where they'll teach how to use their specific um, uh, devices work. And, and it's advertising for them, but it's also very educational for the physician. So industry has been really helpful mm -hmm. in learning these techniques. So for instance, Joel Matta was working with a company by the name of Depew, um, on this direct anterior approach, and Depew held some really great educational seminars uh, at Cadaver Labs in various places across the United States to allow surgeons who are interested in that to go and be trained by Joel and others um, on the technique, and then you'd go and do surgical dissections on cadavers, wow. and so that's how you learn. And then the Academy, uh, the American Association of Orthopedic Surgeons, they have meetings every year, and they do a lot of really uh, phenomenal educational uh, things to let people learn these new techniques. That's so fascinating to me. I think that if, as they're describing that other technique to you, because of your understanding of anatomy and the body and everything else, I think that 
cognitively you can understand okay this is what they're doing but then to have the ability to go on a cadaver and then work through that and get more precise and get better at it i think is really really cool like i didn't even know that that happened oh yeah in fact it has to happen particularly on that type of thing because you know you think well maybe i can read about it and go in there and do it and you can do that for some things but on something that's as big a change as going from say a direct lateral approach to a hip replacement to a, a direct anterior approach that's a big enough and there's an there's enough nuances in it that you got to go do the preoperative or you got to go do the due diligence ahead of time so you you're comfortable in surgery um we call it the pucker factor in surgery when you're in there for the first time doing a new technique it greatly decreases your pucker factor if you feel like okay <laughs> i've done surgical dissections i know what i'm doing i've been to the labs I've, I've done on that but even with that as you go along there's a learning curve and as you go along, you just get better and better, and you learn the nuances of a new technique. But you got to do the due diligence first. Man, that's that's super cool to me. I think that's yeah. so fun. It's fun to hear you using the terms, right, like posterior, anterior, because back when I was going through that, most of us were like, oh, the front, the back, the side, right. whatever, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, but it's, it's interesting. Yeah. No, 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 it's great. I love it. Uh-huh. It's, it's fantastic. You mentioned the the younger people coming in who, who kind of think that they know everything, and I, I totally – get that how do you balance that of okay they're coming in with these new ideas how do you balance okay slow down pup like we need to understand certain things first but then also to be able to accept some of those ideas is is valid and that's actually a good point yeah and it comes through discussion i mean i have a new um uh young partner brant nicholas who's phenomenal uh outstanding Mm -hmm. uh went to mayo in fact we found him through mayo i called my buddies at mayo and, and said who you have in the pipeline that'd be great and his name came up and we interviewed him and uh, we're impressed with him and he came out and he's phenomenal. Yeah. So he'll mention something that he thinks and then I'll push back and say, well, I think this and, and you go back and forth. And then as you're new, you know, and, uh, and you're, you're young and you, you feel like you, and I don't mean that derogatorily. I mean, you got to have confidence, right? Yeah, yeah. And when you're new and you're young and you have confidence and you think, you know, it all, you get set, you get knocked down a few times and you quickly learn that, you know, um, when you're the one, you're the, the, the end person and you're the one responsible for all this and you have a patient that develops a, a, a blood clot and a pulmonary embolism or you have a wound problem or you have a patient that gets an infection, those kind of set you back on your heels a little bit and bring you back to reality that like, you know what, things can happen and you got to be prepared for that. So you got to, you just have to make sure that you've done everything in your power to make sure you're doing it right and you're up to date mm-hmm. so that you can you can offer the patient the best possible percentage of a successful uh, outcome. Yeah. Uh, and things are going to happen, but but it humbles you pretty quickly. That's an interesting mindset. So when I think of that is when you go into any sort of procedure is that okay, if if I do everything right, outcome will be positive or That's is there correct. also if I do everything right, there's still a chance that whatever could happen, whether it's a blood clot right, or an right, infection or anything right. else. I think you do everything you can to minimize that. But if the surgeon does everything right, is there still a risk that something else could go on? Yeah, absolutely there is. Yeah. And I think as you get older, you realize that. You, you, As I've gotten older, I've gained a lot of respect for the possible um, negative things that can happen. Mm-hmm. I mean, because they're there. And sometimes you can do everything right, yeah. and there's still an issue. Or... You do a surgery the same way you do it right, and patient's still having pain for some reason that you can't figure out. You keep trying to, you know, you keep pursuing it, obviously, but there's always, you know, one or two percent of the time there can be an issue. Yeah. Um, and so, and then you just have to, the, the most important thing is not to ignore the issue, and then you have to address that with the patient. And patients are, patients are by and large great. They understand. They understand the risks. We go through them ahead of time. But if somebody comes in with a wound problem and you, you look at them and say, here's what we need to do. Or they call you on a Friday night because they're concerned about something. You pick up the phone and talk to them. You know? Patients are great about that. Yeah. What patients don't like is if you just ignore them and they can't get a hold of anybody and they've got all these questions and concerns, that's when, that's when patients get upset, and I don't blame them for that. That's an interesting conversation, too, because I was talking with my, my other friend who's, who's – early on in his career with orthopedic surgery. The question is, you can have a surgeon who is a genius. They're brilliant. Right. But their bedside manner is a little rough, right? Right. Because all of their social skills through their 20s is gone by going through med school and residency. But then you could also have somebody who is 
personable and very nice and kind, but they may not be as skilled of a surgeon, but they get higher ratings on Google or anything That's else. Right. And so how, how can the person going into a procedure understand which surgeon to choose? Is it, is it the person who's going to have a less chance of having poor outcomes or somebody who's nice? I think they can find both. They can find the person that has both. Yeah. There are enough really intelligent people out there that also have a personality <laughs> yeah. that can talk to a patient. Yeah. And that's where I think patients can, uh, second opinions are a good idea if they're not quite sure. Uh, some patients just feel better with one person, that, uh, one surgeon versus the other. Um, and so, uh, you know, patients will say to me, well, I've, you know, I set up this appointment and I've got this second opinion, another opinion with Dr. So-and-so. And I'll say, you know what? Go see Dr. So-and-so. That's yeah. great. And, and see what they think and see what you think of, of, of their suggestion for you. I think that's great. I've always said to patients that the surgeon who gets upset by you having a second opinion is the person you want to avoid. Yeah. Because uh, anybody worth their salt is, is, is um, fully uh, aware that second opinions can be important and that other people have different ways of doing it. And if they're secure in what they're doing, they don't have a problem with someone getting a second opinion. And they would value, yeah. oh, Dr. So-and-so said maybe we would approach it this way. What do you think of that? Well, that's an interesting concept. Let's talk about it, that yeah. kind of a thing. But there are enough people, and you know, people say, well, how do you find somebody? I think um, now with the Internet and Google, and they can look at reviews – and I don't care who you are, every surgeon's going to have a bad review. You can't please everybody. But by and large, you can see what the trend is on Google of, of people and how um, they're perceived, or surgeons and how they're perceived. And then I always tell people, find an OR nurse or find a nurse in the hospital and ask the nurses what they think of uh, these individuals. Because they see us, um, you know, when we're tired or late yeah. at night when they're calling us. They know, they know who really cares and who's there and and uh, that's a great way to figure out who to go see yeah that's super interesting what how did what if for example let's say that i wanted to go visit you but as we've talked previously about the insurance problem like you're not in my network right, so right. how do does that mean okay if i have a relationship with you i just got to go find somebody else like how does how does somebody well work i that? would do that for you so yeah. and, and that happens or yeah. i'll have a patient that i did a total joint on three years ago and their insurance changed mm -hmm. and now they're not covered at st mark's hospital they need to go to ihc and they'll call, and, and I'll recommend somebody uh, at IHC for them, and vice versa. I have yeah. guys at IHC that don't come to St. Mark's that send me people all the time yeah. that need to come to St. Mark's, and I do the same. So I think you could go back to the original person that you trust, and they will give you a name of somebody that will take good care of you. Hmm. That's super interesting. Yeah, that's how we approach it. Yeah, that's great. A um, couple directions I kind of uh, that are in my mind right now. So let's first yeah. go back to, as we were talking through, you can do everything right, and then there could be kind of a risk there. There was a book I recently read called Thinking in Bets, and it talks about life as kind of a poker hand, right? So when you see those poker hands, you see, okay, this person has a 91% chance of winning, and this one has a nine. Right. And that 91% chance person can be doing everything right and still lose that hand just with those percentages, and it right. kind of changed my mindset yeah. on that. But are there certain, is a hip replacement a hip replacement a hip replacement, or are there certain things that are going on with that patient specifically that makes some a little bit more risky? You have to be a little bit more aware of other things going on, or are they all just kind of the same? No, that's a, great, approach? that's a great question. They're all different yeah. because of the patient's anatomy. In fact, we oftentimes say, uh, whether it's a hip or a knee, but especially with the hips, it's amazing how different the same anatomy can be. Mm. And what I mean by that is if you have someone with a more pendular abdomen, the dissection's more difficult. If you have someone with bigger soft tissue mass... Um, and we have, uh, you know, with some of the population in Salt Lake, um, the Islanders, I mean, their, their soft tissue, their muscle mass is huge. Yeah. And working around that, that muscle mass can be really, really difficult. Yeah. And so we will, we will use components that allow us to sneak in a little bit more easily in that individual as opposed to someone who's got a really... Uh, narrow pelvis, uh, small muscle mass that we can get in and you can drive a truck through there yeah. with the same exposure. So they're, they're all different. Um, the knee, the, the way we approach the, uh, the socket, the acetabulum and the femur is different uh, depending on do they have a really thick cortex and a thin canal versus a thin cortex and a wide capacious canal? Do they have a shallow acetabulum that we're going to need to deepen all those things are, 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 there's a bunch of variables we have to control. And probably the biggest one is before we ever get to the operating room. So is the patient overweight? Yeah. 
So if it's a BMI, if a patient has a BMI, which is body mass index of over 40, that's a hard stop for us now. We, we cannot offer them surgery. So we send them down to um, the weight clinic and have them talk to uh, the people down there who are really uh, great at getting them to get their BMI below 40, whether that's uh, through a diet um, and exercise or whether it's a surgical procedure mm-hmm. to do. Because some of the people, if they're morbidly obese, that's got to be addressed first. Do they smoke? They need, to be, they need to stop smoking for three months before they have surgery because that greatly affects their ability to heal their wound. Um, do they have a previous history of blood clots or DVTs? Do they have inflammatory arthritis? That changes things. Are they on chronic blood thinners? Uh, how do you stop those and bridge them so they're safe to have surgery and then get them back on their blood thinners? All those things, all those variables, variables that are there preoperatively those have to be controlled first and then you have all the surgical uh, variables that you deal with at the time of surgery wow yeah that's a lot going on there because i think i think you that has to be in that conversation though right because if they have an obesity problem and they're getting a joint replaced and that problem still continues and they're expecting all Mm -hmm. their problems to go away Mm -hmm. well weight does add wear and tear to a joint and especially so if it's artificially made right it's not bone anymore that's right there's no question that's probably the hardest discussion i have with people and i've had to have some pretty direct difficult discussions i mean i i try to be um i try to be kind about it i mean i know it's a difficult problem for people to have but at the same time you have to you have to let them know you know your weight is the biggest issue here and i know you're hurting but we got to get your weight controlled and it's interesting to me that usually number one they know it deep inside they know it and number two, they'll, they'll have a spouse or a significant other with them who are very appreciative of me having that discussion with them because they know it. Yeah. And to say, well, we can, we'll deal with your weight after the fact, that doesn't happen. They have to get started on a program before. And I'll tell them, I'll say, look, I'll meet you halfway. Mm-hmm. If you'll go do the things you need to do down at the weight loss clinic and get your BMI below 40, which is still, if you're at a BMI of 35 to 40, that's still a big person, mm-hmm. right? But if you'll get your BMI below 40, I'll meet you halfway. I'll do your surgery then. And then we're going to continue to work on your weight to get your BMI below 35. Um, and most people are pretty receptive about that. Yeah. I've had a couple that have gotten upset with me. And, and I said, you know, you've got two choices. You can either do this, and I'm happy to do your surgery, or you can go elsewhere and find a surgeon that might do your surgery for you now. I don't know if you'll find that, but you might. Yeah. Those are your two options, but I'm not going to do your surgery at your current weight. Yeah. So that's interesting. Again, yeah. that that's going kind of to that bedside manner thing, right? right. You got to, you got to communicate effectively. That's you can't right. just be the nice person saying everything they want to hear. You right. have to give them the truth and what's going on that's and right. deliver it in a way that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. I tell it, it's tough love. Yeah. You know, and you try to, you try to present it in a way that they understand. You know, I tell them, I'm not trying to be difficult. I'm just trying to do what's right for you. Yeah. Um, and this is what's right for you. This is what we need to do. And we'll do it together, but we got to get your weight down. So a lot of it happens preoperatively. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting. And then yeah. for the thousands of procedures you've done, <clears throat> do you see trends of what, what would make somebody more likely to need these replacements? I know weight is one of them. I would assume arthritis is coming in there, but is there certain, okay, they play tennis and basketball, so that's probably, they're probably going to have a likelihood of knee issues. Or what, what are some other things that would drive... I guess you to have more a, a higher likelihood of needing some sort of yeah, a replacement. Yeah, it's it's uh, multifactorial, mm-hmm. but probably the biggest thing is your genetics. Really? Right. Yeah. So, do you have a history, family history of osteoarthritis? That's the that's the biggest one, um, and then inflammatory arthritis like rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, um, mm-hmm. those kind of things. Uh, and if you have a family history of those, that puts you at a category. In fact, there's been, there's been studies done that will actually can quantitate uh, if you have a family history and what your x-ray looks like, what the percentage chance of you needing a total joint in the next mm-hmm. five years or 10 years. It's pretty fascinating stuff. Um, but that's number one. And then number two is if you have that kind of family history and if you have a compromised joint, and what I mean by that is, Say you have dysplasia of your hip, you have a shallow socket, so you don't have full coverage, so the weight per unit area of the femoral head is greater. Mm-hmm. Well, you shouldn't be jogging. I mean, that's, you're just going to wear that out. And yeah. we, I see that all the time, and particularly in men with a dysplasia, they wear them out in their 50s, and they're in my office in their 50s, and they need a joint replacement. 
So they should gravitate towards a different type of um, exercise. Mm -hmm. uh, or someone who's had an, anti an ACL rupture of their knee and now they have an unstable knee and they want to continue to jog and do those things. Well, that's going to ultimately end up um, accelerating the degeneration of their joint. So mm -hmm. if they have some kind of predisposing issue like that, they have to modify their ex exercise activity. How, how would I know, right? As a, I'm 32, so as a 32-year-old, how do I know, well, you know what, maybe I shouldn't be jogging and I should be cycling, or maybe how would I know if I haven't? Uh, the first, that the first thing you'd get is uh, you'd be, you know, you look fit and trim and you're probably jogging five miles a day and, <laughs> and doing those kind of things, but um, uh, you would have some discomfort, and that discomfort would you lead you to come and see someone like me mm -hmm. or your internist who would send you to someone like me We'd get x-rays and we'd say, you know what, Eric, you got some dysplasia of your hip joint. You've got a shallow socket. And the reason you're getting groin pain now is because you're really, really active. And although you're fit and trim, your hips got this issue. And so I don't want you, I don't want you jogging five miles a day. I'd rather have you cycling yeah. 15 miles uh, three times a week or something like that. That's how it usually comes about is, it, is people, they start getting discomfort and then they come in and then we discover it at that point. Awesome. And we get into family history then and all that too. Yeah, that's super interesting. We'll, we'll have to talk later about some of the ailments that I have in my yeah, life. Yeah, we'll do it. We'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> so take me, take me through this, and, and I, I want to be respectful of your time here, but kind okay. of the, the day in the life of a doctor, because we've talked about all kind of these aspects. Now let's put it all together. So talking about meeting with a patient for the first time, setting up a plan, and then also the procedure itself, and then clinic and, yeah. and the follow-up. So what does that look like for you as, as you – have a work day, what, what are you looking at? What are you dealing with as you go in in the morning? Yeah, so our work days, unless we're, we have a, um, uh, an emergency or something urgent comes up, uh, which happens, and then we adjust. But Are you on call as, as in a, doing what you do? do you ever, are oh, you yeah. on call like another doctor, like an ER doctor as an example? Oh, yeah, well, so we, I'm on call 24-7 for my patients. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. You know, and so now, though, that I'm older, I'm... Mike Bourne and I share a position, and so mm -hmm. he's on this week. That's why I'm here with you. <laughs> yeah. So, But right before I got here, he called me about a patient of mine that was having a little bit of a wound issue mm -hmm. uh, that he's going to deal with tomorrow for me because he's there. But a typical, um, a typical week for us, and even when I was doing this full-time, a typical week is um, every other day schedule, and we learned this at Mayo. So Mondays I'm in the clinic all day seeing patients. Tuesday I'm operating all day. Wednesday, I'm in the clinic all day. Thursday, I'm operating all day. And then Friday's kind of a catch-all for stuff that maybe somebody needs to be seen urgently or I need to add on a surgical procedure, something like that. And I've got other partners that do it on different days, you know. So I've got partners that operate all day Monday, see patients, that kind of a thing. Yeah. So it's kind of every other. That's that's the way that works best. And is clinic, you're, you're meeting with initial consultations yes. and post-operative? Like exactly. What does clinic mean? Yeah, clinic is seeing patients. You said it just perfectly. Okay. It's new patients and then follow-ups. Okay. Um, and pa patients who might be having some difficulties. or, But I think patients oftentimes come in and, and they have this perception that that if they come and see me, they're gonna, they have to have surgery. And that's not the case at all. The majority of people I see, I follow for a year, two years, three years before we ever do any surgery on them. Mm -hmm. It'd be like you coming in and, and, we, and getting an x-ray and saying, Eric, you've got hip dysplasia. This is what we need to do, the conservative measures. And then I see you in another two years and you come in and you say, it's getting worse. Yeah. Let's look at it. And so it's a, it's a process. But then ultimately, and sometimes I'll see patients that are referred because they're at the end stage of their arthritis and they need to have a hip replacement. So we'll talk to them about that hip or knee replacement. We'll talk to them about that and then we'll schedule them for their surgery. Mm -hmm. So, so clinic days are seeing patients, talking to patients, scheduling surgeries that need to be scheduled. Um, and those, those are really, really busy days. Yeah. I mean, it's like musical chairs. We run out of four rooms and I come out of one room and my PA is saying, you got to go there now. And you got, they're just pointing me in the right direction. And I have some incredible help uh, that makes it possible um, with a, a PA and a nurse practitioner and then a couple MAs, medical assistants, and they make it happen. And then surgical days are, um, we start those at 7 in the morning um, uh, and just work through the day. Uh, but we, we know that they're pretty well. I mean, we know the times pretty well now. Uh, yeah. And so uh, we know when to have the pa patients come in the day of surgery now. They don't come in the night before anymore. Oh, nice. That's a, yeah, that's a, that's a better thing for the patients and, and the insurance companies. Yeah. Um, so uh, 
and then we just work through the day. And then if something happens, we'll add a case on at the end of the day or um, that kind of a thing. Yeah, I was going to ask how you keep it all straight, right? Because as you're going the musical chairs, as you described it, from one to the other to the other to the other, and I'm assuming that there are images that you have to look at before right. you go in, because you have a limited amount of time with right, the patient right, and go right. in there, right? I mean, right. it can't be a two-hour-long conversation with every patient. Otherwise, you couldn't help That's exactly people, right. right? Yeah. So you have to be efficient, and you have mm-hmm. to, but at the same time, get across what you have to get you're, across. You're exactly right, and that, there's the art of it. Right? Yeah. So if we have a patient who's having problems where I know somebody that's coming in, and I know they're a bit long-winded, I put them at the end of the morning Mm -hmm. so I can just sit there and run into the lunch hour if I need be, or I put them at the end of the afternoon. So it's like I can sit there and not worry that I'm holding everybody else up. Um, Rechecks we do uh, in the morning because they're usually quick. Bing, 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 bing. And uh, so we try to, but once in a while you get a red herring that slows you down. And then you you take the time and uh, sometimes I'll say to a patient, listen, I'm happy to discuss this with you further, but I got a number of patients I need to see. Why don't you go have lunch, come back, and let's discuss it further? That kind of a thing. Yeah. Uh, we'll forewarn patients if I'm running behind. We try to forewarn them and say, "Do you want to stay and wait? Do you want to go to lunch and come back, mm-hmm. uh, or come back this evening? I'll stay in the evenings and see people if I need to." That kind of a thing. And does that come in because they they're unsure, they're afraid, they they don't know what's going on, so they have a lot of questions. Yeah. I mean, is that is that kind of what prompts those longer conversations? Is that they just want to know all the details and yeah. what's what's going on? Exactly, and everybody's different. Yeah. So I refer to the Minnesota farmer that I used to take care of when I was at Mayo. Mm-hmm. Those guys would come in and they'd have a horrible hip, and they'd say, "What do you need to do?" And I'd say, "Well, you need a hip replacement." And they'd say, "Great, when can we do it?" I don't don't bother me with the details. I just want it done. Yeah, boom. And then you have the guy, I call in the Chicago attorneys, they come in and they have four sheets of single spaced questions typed out. Yeah. Uh, the, and they want answers to those. And that's okay. I mean, yeah. they deserve to have those, an- those questions answered, but everybody's different. Yeah. Some people want every little answer to every little possible question and nuance and others just say, don't bother me with that stuff. I don't want to know. Just fix me. Yeah. And you never know. So you just kind of play this. <laughs> this game and if i've got if i've got the long-winded patient in one room i can step out for a minute see some others really quick come back you know there's all that kind of stuff going on but that's the that's kind of the art of juggling those again i think it's amazing what what physicians and and surgeons everything that all all of on down to nurses and everything else right the personalities that you have to be able to interact with and communicate with and all that i think is incredible so take me through but yeah i don't mean to interrupt it but yeah, yeah that's the fun part of it right So I'll have uh, uh, some partners get frustrated with that. And I say to them, you know, if you let it be, that's the fun part of it. The patient interaction is the fun part of it. Yeah, Uh, It can be the most trying, but when you deal with that and you're able to deal with the, uh, you know, the the patient who's upset or the patient who's really weary or, 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 or afraid, that's very satisfying. Yeah. So that's the fun part of it. Surgery is really, really fun because you're just, focused and you're in there and nobody's nobody's biting at you clinic's a different different animal yeah. but it's really it's it's really gratifying to to be able to solve those issues for patients well and that's the human element right, right. That, i mean exactly it, right because you could just if you could just replace it with a robot then that's, then exactly that's not right. but you're exactly right. you're able to interact and feel emotions right. and everything else right so take me through that operating room, if you if you can. So who's in the operating room? What's What does the timeline look like? What's going on in an OR? Yeah, the OR is very efficient, uh, especially for us, because um, we do the same procedure, basically the same procedure over and over and over again. And we have this, I'm fortunate because I have the same personnel in there every Tuesday and Thursday. Mm-hmm. So um, patient comes in the room uh, with... There's an anesthesiologist, obviously, Mm -hmm. and most of the time they're going to put in a spinal anesthetic. And then we have a circulating nurse who kind of runs the, you know, she she or he are running around and making sure that all of the peripheral things we need in the OR are set up and the table's right and all that. And then we have a scrub nurse um, who I have the same person, uh, uh, Braden, every Tuesday and Thursday, who's phenomenal. And... Those are the people that scrub in with us and actually hand the instruments to me. Okay. And they get so good that I don't even have to ask for it. I just put my hand out, and the one I need is there. He mm-hmm. just knows the the next step, or knows if I if I ask for a, a cushion, he knows he's gonna he's gonna take the coagulant because I'm gonna buzz a vessel or something like that, yeah. coagulate a vessel. Um, 
So he's there, and then either my PA or my nurse practitioner are in there too, helping with uh, retracting and setting up the case, and they'll usually close for me, mm -hmm. and then me. So there's really three of us actually operating, wow. okay? The scrub tech, me, and the, my nurse practitioner, and then uh, the nurse circulator, mm -hmm. and she oftentimes will have someone helping her as well, and then the anesthesiologist, yeah. that's the group. Oh, that's interesting. And I, the the few times that I shadowed, it seemed like the anesthesiologist is kind of there and just kind of monitoring stuff oh, yeah. and off um, behind a curtain, if I remember right. And there's yeah. just kind of they're behind a barrier for sterility. Yeah, yeah. So they're they're up at the head of the table with the head. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then we're doing our thing below. Yep. That's interesting. As you mentioned too, with each patient is different in their their anatomy, meaning like the sizes or the structures or anything else. When you're having these components come in with a hip or a knee are there different sizes of oh, those yeah, things oh, yeah, like how yeah. do you match that up with the yeah, patient and what's yeah. going on there that's a great question and i failed to mention we also have the rep mm -hmm. for the company uh whose prosthesis we're going to use okay yeah. so whether it's uh ortho development corporations components or depuse components we'll have that rep there and they're an integral part of it and they have all the trays right that are sterilized ready to go so preoperatively, we do preoperative templating. So the software now is such that I can put up an image and I can play around with different prostheses because they're different. They're, they can be different lengths and different uh, sizes, different offsets, all those kind of things. So we can do a preoperative template and see which prosthesis we think is going to fit that particular anatomy the best. Mm. And then we have that um, rep with that prosthesis in the room. And then when we're building it, we have all these trials components. Mm -hmm. And then once we, once we build up the, the, the trial hip, if you will, and we get interoperative imaging so I can see exactly what it's going to look like, uh, then we put the real components in. And the rep hands us those real components. Wow. Yeah. I mean, again, 25 years ago, was that going on no. with these images and so building? And that seems when amazing. I was a, when I was a resident at Mayo, we had three sizes. <laughs> Small, medium, and large. Wow. And you made one of those three sizes work. Wow. Now, on a hip replacement, on the components I use, oh, let's see, on the stem, uh, we have, um, they start we, 12, 15 sizes on the stem. And then on the cup, they go up in two millimeter increments, starting at 42, uh, going all the way up to 65 in two wow. millimeter increments. Wow. So it's it's... It's a whole different ballgame. I think of it like a suit, right? You can go off the rack and get a small, medium, or large suit, or you can get it custom tailored. That's and exactly it seems right. like now it's this custom it's tailored. Custom ta yeah. you don't, that's that's it's incredible. P patients, it's, it's a great point you actually bring up. Patients will ask me about, uh, well, do I need a um, custom prosthesis? Mm -hmm. And the answer is no, because we basically customize it at the time of surgery anyway. Yeah. I mean, with the preoperative templating and the array of choices that we have, you can you can custom build what you need and it's really apparent when you do revisions and you have these modular components both on the knee side and the hip side where you can add stems and offsets and wedges and and sleeves um, you're really customizing a component on those difficult cases right on the table that's incredible yep that is so cool so so you said it's such an efficient or because of the 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 crew or the, the people the that are with you right what does that time look like for a typical hip and or a typical knee, if I'm going to go into the OR, what, what should I expect time-wise to... Yeah, so so the surgical time for hip or a knee is, for me, it's about an hour, hour and a half of mm -hmm. the nitty-gritty of doing the surgery. So from the time I make the incision to the time that's closed. But I tell patients to by the time to get them in the room, anesthetized, prepped and draped, do the surgery, back to the recovery room, that's three hours. Yeah. Um, and so we schedule that the day accordingly uh, for for that. Yeah. And some surgeons are faster, and some are a lot slower. Um, uh, but I, that's a good that's a good efficient number, I think, mm -hmm. where uh, you're efficient, but you're also careful. Yeah. And that's where most of my partners are is right in that that time frame as well. That's fascinating. What What would you say has been kind of the most challenging part of being an orthopedic surgeon throughout your career? Um, well, probably two things. One is trying to balance the work with the home, mm -hmm. you know, your personal life. Yeah, that's. I think that's a challenge uh, because even if, even if you're in an employed situation, it's just the nature of the beast. It's a it's a time demanding uh, profession. Yeah, people's problems don't occur at a convenient time all the time. Yeah. or people you know will call you on a Saturday when you've got plans and say, hey. 
you know, my wife just fell and broke her ankle or, you know, those kind of things. And you want to respond to that. Yeah. Um, and I think balancing that with the uh, home life uh, uh, is probably the most difficult. Now, I've been fortunate because I have a, a, a super wife who's just been amazing through. She, I was married when I was in, in residency. So mm-hmm. she's been amazing through the whole thing and still is. She understands that. If someone calls me, even on a week that I'm supposedly now not supposed to be working, I'll yeah. oftentimes say, hey, I really want to respond for this patient. And she's like, okay, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> go, go do your thing. I'm used to this. That's probably number one. Uh, and I think, I think that's an ongoing battle for everybody. And number two, and this gets back to what you and I were originally talking about, um, particularly in private practice, dealing with the insurance companies yeah. has become ever increasingly difficult um, and especially if you're in private practice, seeing the devaluation, the, the the unilateral devaluation of what you do has really been frustrating. Uh, is that coming from them saying, we're only going to pay this much? Is it coming from them saying, well, what makes you think they need this? What about this? Like kind well, of second guessing? Yeah, all of the yeah. above. So, you know, sometimes I'll have to get on the phone with an uh, insurance uh, adjuster, usually a physician who's doing uh, pre-authorizations for an insurance company. And he'll want to know why so-and-so needs an MRI scan or wh- why so-and-so needs a, what we call a Mars MRI scan. You know, maybe they have a metal, metal bearing surface and I'm looking for um, what we call metallosis or, or inflammation going from that. And I'll have to get on the phone and explain to a uh, internist who's doing an insurance review for an insurance company why I need a Mars MRI scan on a patient. It's just ridiculous. It's mm-hmm. a waste of time. They always approve it after I talk to them. Yeah. But yet, in my mind, the insurance company, if I'm a provider for them, they ought to trust me that I'm doing the right thing unless I have a history where I haven't been. And that's really, that's just added a lot of bureaucracy and expense to the system. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's, that's really, really frustrating. And then you're exactly right, insurance companies. So orthopedists have become, and it's true of every uh, specialty, we've become more efficient uh, and and better at doing these things yeah so insurance companies look at that and they go well now you're only having to keep the patient in the hospital overnight we shouldn't be having to pay you what we paid you in the past because you're it's it's an easier procedure yeah. well it's not an easier procedure and the risks are still the same um but they'll say so we're going to pay you instead of x now we're going to pay x minus y it starts with medicare and then it gravitates to all the insurance companies and they can do it unilaterally yeah uh, and physicians can't um, unionize um, uh, because that would be a uh, restriction of trade, I, I, but it's set up so physicians can't unionize. So they can pick off physicians individually and say, you know, you either accept this fee schedule or we won't have you be our provider. Yeah. And there are, there are different entities in different states that have tried to com- com- combat that. Yeah. Uh, and that's another reason why I think surgeons are better off now being employed because I don't have to do that anymore. Mm-hmm. I don't have to negotiate with insurance companies anymore. HCA does that, yeah, and they pay me a good rate to do what I do. So it's 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 a good system doing it that way, mm-hmm. and they can do a better job of negotiating with an insurance company than a than a lone orthopedic surgeon who's busy anyway, and that's the last thing he wants to be doing. He or she wants to be doing. Yeah, that's interesting. I, yeah. I, you talk about it takes an hour, hour and a half to do these procedures, and plus the recovery time is shrunk. And so in my mind, it's almost like we're not. You're not paying for that hour and a half. You're paying for the last 40 years of advancements exactly. and, tech and skill and everything else exactly right. that has gotten you this outcome. Yep. But but in, it's seen as, oh, it yep. took an hour and a half. Why? And you're paying for the next three months of follow-up. Yeah. Because that's, that's all part of the fee. Yeah. But that's well stated. And I, we should have you go talk to the insurance company. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that. Well, yeah. and I was thinking back to when you were talking about the pre-authorizations of, is that is that coming from them not wanting to pay or is that coming from the fact that maybe there were some or there's a small very small fraction of doctors that are not doing it correctly and that are ordering things that are not right and so it's like look this these few bad apples are making it more difficult for the rest of you because yep. we've had instances of malpractice or fraud or whatever it might i be. think that's what it is yeah yeah i think that i think that's true in society we make rules based on the bad the bad apples yeah which are, is a minority of the uh of the people yeah right? Uh, you, you look at laws or anything in society, it's based on those few, relatively few, that, that uh, misbehave yeah. uh, percentage-wise. 
And I think insurance companies, same thing. I mean, everybody doesn't need an MRI scan. And, mm -hmm. and, and in fairness to the insurance companies, I think MRI scans are the most grossly overutilized test there is. Mm -hmm. I have people come to see me with routine arthritis of the hip joint who have received an MRI scan and not a routine x-ray. Well, that just makes no sense at all. Yeah. I mean, you have to start with a routine x-ray. And if you need an MRI scan because of some nuance or something, then you should get it. Most of the time, you don't need it. And so I understand the insurance, and they're expensive. Yeah. So I understand the insurance companies need to uh, get those preauthorized. Yeah. Um, it's just that if they have a provider that has a good track record and they know that, they should make amends for that. It would save them time and it would save the good provider time as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other thing that they, you always have to do is you always have to preauthorize surgeries. So Mrs. Jones has a horrible hip. That has to be sent into the review. It has to be reviewed. Then they'll give you an approval for a certain amount of time to get yeah. it done. Well, you know, that's okay. That's what they have to do. But, again, it's time-consuming. It takes man hours to do that. And it's become a, a problem, and it can be a, become a problem if you have a patient with an urgent uh, problem. For instance, I had a lady come in 12 years after hip replacement. She'd worn out her polyethylene. The polyethylene had, had flipped out of the socket that it that contains it so now she was rubbing a metal head on on the metal part of her socket it actually squeaks when they do that wow that's an urgent problem because she can destroy the socket and if she destroys the socket you have to change everything mm -hmm. but if you get in there immediately you can usually go in clean it up and just pop in a new modular polyethylene and take care of the problem so i say well we're going to do this tomorrow and uh, my crew says well we not we might not be able to get her pre-authorized for tomorrow well mm -hmm. that's like it's not in the best interest of the patient. Yeah. So we did. I just said, well, we're going to do her. I don't care what the insurance company says. Yeah. And I'm at the age now where, what are they going to do to me, right? <laughs> yeah. So is, is there uh, kind of a, for coming from the drug world? Is there we call it step therapy? Is there a similar thing there before surgery? Have you tried this? Have yeah, you tried yeah. this? Oh, yeah. Have you tried this? Oh, yeah. 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 Absolutely. And in the workup, they'll look for that. And and I get that. They'll look for. Uh, has the patient tried conservative measures? Have they modified their activities? Have they been on anti-inflammatory medications? Have they tried other med You know, all those things have to be in the history and physical exam to have it approved. And then what does the x-ray look like? And yeah. they have to, certain keywords: loss of joint space, subchondral sclerosis, cyst formation, osteophyte formation, you know, mm -hmm. those things. Yeah. And if they see all that, if the reviewer sees all that, and the reviewer, by the way, is usually a nurse or or even a physician that isn't an orthopedic surgeon, but they have, they're looking at a sheet that gives them key things that to look for in the H and in the history and physical, and as they tick those off, then they approve it. Yeah. Um, but again, I think insurance companies would do themselves a favor if they have providers with known good track records to not go through all that. Yeah. Process. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Um, what would what would constitute an X-ray versus an MRI versus oh. another test? What was you're talking to them, like, you know what, maybe you don't need anything or, yeah, let's take a look and, and figure things out. Yeah, so you you mean in terms of what are they, in, what what's the difference actually or when do we use one versus the other? Uh, well, let's go both, right, because you had mentioned that sometimes somebody has an MRI without having an yeah, x-ray first. Yeah, so, yeah, so what yeah. would constitute that decision or, I don't know, what is that thought process? Yeah, I of? think in, in some, um, uh, for some primary caregivers, the, the thought is that the MRI scan will show what an x-ray shows and, and everything else, too. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and that's just not true. So I think it ought to start with a routine x-ray, just mm -hmm. an x-ray. So if I come to you and I say my knee hurts, you say, well, let's take an x-ray and let's look at what's going on. And chances are you're not going to need an MRI scan. Okay. So and then when you x-ray history and physical examination, okay, will then dictate if I know what's going on well enough to say to you, this is what it is, this is what we need to do, or... Well, you might have something internally going on, maybe a meniscal tear, so we're going to want to get an MRI scan so we can see those internal structures, see and, and, and then decide what the best course of treatment is. So what does an MRI show that an X-ray doesn't? Soft tissues, okay. especially. Okay. It shows the soft tissue. that An, an X-ray just shows the bone, but it shows the bone really, really, really well. MRI scan is going to show the soft tissue. So in, in the case of a knee, it gives us the opportunity to look inside the knee without actually doing it. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So on an MRI scan on, an, on a knee, I can see the menisci, I can see the, the cruciate ligaments, I can see the medial lateral collateral ligaments, I can see your gastroc, you know, it's on and on and on. You can yeah. see it all. So if you have somebody that you're concerned about a soft tissue injury that isn't getting better, 
that's when you do the MRI scan. But you usually don't get it right out of the chute unless you're dealing with a acute injury and you want to know, geez, did they completely rip out their medial collateral ligament in addition to their ACL? Did they rupture their patellar tendon? Those kind of things. Then you'd get one acutely. But usually you're, you're dealing with people and you're, you're treating them. You see them back in two to three weeks. If they're not any better, that's when you go ahead and get the MRI. Scan. And with the MRI, the image itself, is that a 360 image? I mean, are you able to see? Yeah, but it's directions? in slices and okay. your brain yeah. gets used to you. So it's in three different slices, right? It's transaxial, coronal, and the sagittal images. And then as you're going through those images, just because you've been there a lot and you, you and we, we know the anatomy, it forms a three-dimensional structure in your head. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah, so you can see them on different images. And now that everything's digital, it used to be that we'd get this big packet of x-rays and you'd be putting them up on the, on the view box and going through them all. But now with digital, you know, we just pull them up on the, on the screen that every um, room has in it. And then you can just scroll through these pictures. And I can do that at home. That's the um, other beauty of it. I, I, can pull up, I, can, I can pull up anybody's films at home. So the emergency room calls me and I'm at home. I can pull up the films and talk to them about it. Wow, that's yeah. super cool. Um, so that all came from what is the most challenging part of your job? Let's yeah, go yeah, to what, yeah. What's that's been the most rewarding? What's been the most rewarding for you? Oh, there's this no time? question. The most rewarding is patient interaction. Yeah. I mean, when you have, when people say to me, what are you going to miss most when you finally decide to retire fully? And, and that's what it will be is patient. There's, there's just no better feeling than when someone comes in and they give you a big hug and they say, ah, you changed my life. I feel like I'm. 15 years, 20 years younger, I can go back and play tennis or golf or hike or ski. Yeah. Um, that's the best. Or chase my grandkids or, you know, like run around yeah. and move, go on walks. Yep. Right. And that's a great point. I literally have people say, I just want to be able to get on the floor and play with my grandson. I want to be yeah. able to pick him up. Yeah. You know, um, that's the best part yeah. without question. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. What, what is an area of healthcare that you wish you could learn more about? Um, Probably uh, the delivery of healthcare and how it's become so cumbersome. And you see this yeah. with where you are here and how confusing it is for not only patients, but for us who mm -hmm. are providing the care. It's really, really confusing for everybody. I wish we could streamline it. Yeah. Um, and the only way I could streamline it would be to know more about it. Yeah. Um, and even postoperatively, you know, the push now is for everybody to go home and go home within 24 hours. And that's a good thing. That's been shown to be a good thing. But there are certain individuals, um, the older patient uh, who's 80, who lives alone, who's petrified about going home at 24 hours, who ought to be able to go to a rehab facility. That used to be easy to do. Now it's, it's just like pulling teeth. Yeah. It's so difficult to get those patients into a rehab facility. Um, I'd like to know more about that. I'd like to know a way that we could we could fix that yeah. and streamline that. Um, patients ought to be able to take uh, their insurance coverage and provide their benefit to anybody that they want. If they find somebody that they feel comfortable with, I don't care what network they're in, mm -hmm. they ought to be able to take their insurance benefit and apply it to that individual. We have insurance companies that are allowed to absolutely deny them their benefit. Um, and I'm not saying the insurance company should have to pay more if they go to an outside provider. I'm saying they should at least give that patient the benefit they paid for and let that patient apply that towards the provider that they want to use. Yeah. Um, that's just wrong. Yeah. And so that area um, uh, is something that I'd, I'd love to know a lot more about and be able to do something about. Yeah, yeah, it is so complex. I mean, oh, we, it's we have people, physicians, attorneys, I mean, people that are just the highest level of intellectual capacity. Mm -hmm. And then we come in and we start talking about Medicare and they're like, what is going on? Like, how am <laughs> I supposed to keep this straight? I mean, you can keep every structure of the body straight and, and all these procedures, but then Medicare is just this whole other animal. Right? Oh yeah. And what's the difference between Medicare and Medicaid? People get those oh, confused yeah. all the time. Yeah. Well, I know from my own uh, standpoint as I'm looking uh, towards full retirement and I, uh, I'm looking at Medicare. I was in your offices just a month ago talking to Matt Gibson, yeah, yeah. trying to make 
make sense of it for myself and my family. Yeah. So uh, you need people with expertise in that uh, field. Yeah, to help. and you've got Social Security, Medicare, all that stuff coming up there. you got <laughs> you got right. some big decisions to <laughs> make right. with. That's right, and it's confusing. With a lot of stuff. It's confusing. Before I get into our last getting to know you section with it or a little bit more random questions, uh, is there anything I haven't asked that I should have? No, I think you're questions have been really uh really uh well thought out oh, thank uh, you yeah. yeah it's allowed us to cover a lot of stuff no i appreciate you taking the time here so oh, yeah it's fun so these last three questions are a little bit more uh i guess random um so the first one is when you meet somebody what is something that i'm trying to figure out how to phrase this correctly how, what is something that you respect in people what is something that you value in an interaction with a person well first would be their honesty you know uh, whether i'm dealing with a patient or uh, paramedical personnel um you know i used to tell residents when i was at mayo if i ask you a question you don't know the answer it's okay to say i don't know Mm -hmm. but i'll find out yeah it's not okay to just free will it and throw something out there hoping that it will stick yeah um so that's probably number one Number two is I really enjoy people that can interact like you interact. Oh, you thank know. you. Some people have, and for whatever reason, I don't know what their personal history is, but they'll have this kind of barrier that's hard to get through. And maybe they've been traumatized. And maybe they've been traumatized badly by physicians and their experience has been really, really bad. Mm-hmm. So they come in with just kind of this rough exterior. Um, and so uh, usually, you know, we try hard to break, break through that. But uh, when you're asking me what are the qualities I enjoy in people it's honesty and it's people who are willing to have a conversation and and share in that conversation uh, things about themselves uh, as well as just asking me uh, you know my thoughts yeah so that's great Um, if you were not a physician an orthopedic surgeon what would you be oh that's a great question wow I haven't thought about that Uh, I don't know I mean my undergraduate degree was business finance I probably would be in business in some form or another, mm-hmm. uh, even though I didn't enjoy that when my dad was, you know, my grandfather started a business and my dad had that business as well, it's still going today. And I never really enjoyed uh, that entity. Mm-hmm. Uh, not enough personal interaction. Uh, I mean, you asked me what I enjoyed most about practice and it's the interaction with all these different patients. That's the best part. So it'd have to be a business where I had some interaction with a lot of people. Yeah. But that's probably what I would do. Okay. Mike Bourne and I talk about it on occasion. That's probably that's what we would have done. Hopefully, we have done that together. We created this clinic together. So that's I think that it'd be in business somewhere. Yeah, that's awesome. Definitely not attorney <laughs> <laughs> or insurance and, or insurance. <laughs> I can say that because I have a brother-in-law who's an attorney, past Utah Supreme Court justice, and my dad was an attorney too, mm. although he used it in business. So. Yeah. So I can make that joke. Oh, that's awesome. And I have a lot of friends who are, are good attorneys too. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's definitely their their value is there. Yeah. I just don't know if I could handle I could handle it. You're exactly right. And that's what I meant by that. I yeah. just don't like their day, it just seems to me is full of confrontation. That's what they do. Yeah. And I just don't I I just wouldn't want to spend my day doing that. Yeah. I'd rather be trying to trying to be more appeasing and 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 help they're helping in a different way yeah. they just have to do it through a confrontational um platform yeah 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 totally yeah. so excluding family because yeah. because that's it is what it is what would you consider one of your greatest accomplishments and greatest is tough because it's just right. sets them, but what is one of the, the greatest accomplishments of, that you feel of your life well, I think uh, if I look back at my male clinic days, for them to ask me to stay on staff there yeah. was huge. Uh, for, that meant a lot to me. Mm-hmm. And that was a difficult thing to leave. Um, but that's probably the single most in, in uh, my profession, this, the, be- the single pinnacle of what I accomplished. Yeah. And then creating what we created at the Salt Lake Orthopedic Clinic, that, that's been huge. That's been a process, and that's been huge. Yeah. Um, I, those two. Okay. Yeah. I, I guess if you said, well, and then beyond that, it's it's the continual pursuit of uh, perfection mm-hmm. and, and staying on top of things and learning new techniques so that I think we do hips, hip and knee replacements uh, the right way and the current way. Uh, I'd say those three things. That's awesome. We're, this is 
I have one more getting to know you question, but you just prompted another. So yeah. you've seen how it's changed over the last 40 years with hip and knee replacements. Where do you see that going? Oh, you know, I, I didn't, uh, I couldn't have foreseen what we do now. I just, I just foresee it uh, getting any, even better. I think the weak link, if you say, what is the weak, weak link? And it's not a very, very weak link, but, but is the uh, bearing surfaces mm-hmm. that we're dealing with. I, th- I think those are going to continue to improve. Yeah. The, the polyethylene is tr- incredible now, both on the hip side and the, and the knee side. But I see that as continuing to improve as these smart bioengineers, you know, break down these products and, and figure out ways to make them stronger and less likely to, to uh, wear mm. and delaminate. Um, I think people are going to continue to push um, soft tissue sparing techniques yeah. and make those continue to be better. Um, although they're really, really good now. I tell people it's a great time to have a joint replacement in 2021 yeah. compared to 10 years ago. Um, and then I think the perioperative... Uh, modalities, both the preoperative medications and the postoperative medications to alleviate the postoperative discomfort are going to continue to get better. Mm-hmm. We use less and less narcotics now than we used to. Yeah. And that's a good thing. And there are various medications that block different pain receptors that we load people up with preoperatively and we use postoperatively. Um, that's going to continue to get better. So mm-hmm. I think for the patient standpoint, it's just going to continue to be a better, better, um, procedure yeah. with less discomfort and better long-term results than it's been in the past. When you talk about durability, how long can someone expect their joint to <clears throat> maintain itself? Well, they'll never, ever wear out the metal pieces anymore. It used to be that with stainless steel, we could see fractures of the stem mm. on, on the hip side and on the, on the trays on the, on, the, on the knee side. But now that you're dealing with cobalt, chrome, and titanium, that just doesn't happen anymore. Mm. Sometimes with some of the modular necks on the f- on the hip side on the femur, those those products have fa- failed with some fractures. But nobody, to my knowledge, nobody's using those anymore. I don't even think they make those anymore. So a solid cobalt chromium stem and titanium base plate, um, you'll never wear those out. Mm. What you'll wear out if you're going to wear out anything is the polyethylene. Okay. So if you had a joint, a young healthy guy like you that's going to pound it. 20, 25 years, you might, ne- you might need to then at that time have the polyethylene replaced. Mm-hmm. The good news is, is that it's modular, so you can sneak in, whether it's your knee or your hip, you can sneak in, pull out the poly, pop in a new one. You don't have to do any of the bony work because your, your metal pieces are going to be, be fine. You'll pop in a new polyethylene, and you're off and running again. Mm-hmm. The bad news is it's still a surgical procedure that you have to undergo. So... Um, I think uh, the longevity is going to get greater as the polyethylene continues to improve. That's fascinating. It, it, in my mind, I'm thinking of like car parts almost. Right? It, like it's you like used that. to have to take off everything, but now car parts, you just going to pop this off, pop on another one. That's and right. You're good to go. I told the, uh, the lady that I mentioned earlier that wore out her polyethylene after 12 years, and hers is old polyethylene, by the way. Mm-hmm. But I told her exactly that. I said, we just need to give you a tire change. <laughs> yeah, you know, it should make sense to her. So. Oh, that's great. Yeah, All yeah. right. The last getting to know you question, and then we'll, we'll let you get away. Um, again, excluding family. Yeah. What is the most beautiful thing you've ever seen? That can be a place. That can be something else. What's the most beautiful thing you've ever seen? <laughs> I know what it is. I'm just a little emotional. Um, my new granddaughter. Yeah. Isn't, man, babies, Hmm. it's something else. Yeah, she's three months old and, uh, sorry, was uh, was born premature, but that is, that's the one. That's the most beautiful thing I've seen. That's awesome. Oh, but that's family, isn't it? Yeah, well, I'll I'll take that. So now let's go excluding family. So So that's beautiful. So now I won't get uh, so emotional. Babies are a miracle. I mean, again, just taking the anatomy, physiology. I have nowhere near the experience you do, but they're just like, how do we live? How do we survive? Well, um, yeah, so you told me not to do that, and I did it anyway. No, I love it. Um, Probably the most beautiful place, Portofino, Italy, I would say. Okay. Yeah. And then the minute I leave here, I'm going to think of something else. But... uh, (laughs) 
<laughs> that's uh, that's probably the most beautiful place, and that even involves family because my family was with me. Yeah, there, yeah. That's what's tough. His family is always going to yeah, be involved. They're always involved. involved right? with that. They're always involved with that deal. Mark, I am so appreciative, uh, so appreciative of you taking the time my to pleasure. do this and and pleasure. give us insight into your life yeah. and your yeah. experience. Yeah. And it's it's yeah. amazing. I can see just from your emotion, not just with family, but in talking about how much you you love your patients. Yeah. You're, you're amazing. So, Thank you. So I appreciate you. It's been a pleasure to meet you, Eric. Thank okay. you for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah. I, hopefully we can keep in touch. After I hope this. so. That's yeah. Great. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, sir. Hey, as we wrap up this episode, we just wanted to let you know that we record these live. So sometimes we misspeak or say things that we didn't mean to. We also run each episode by some other outside experts just to make sure that we got all of our facts straight. So in the show description, you'll find a link to some more information around the topics that we discussed. So be sure to check that out. And if you enjoyed this episode and want to hear others like it, be sure to subscribe. Again, thanks for listening.